Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Discovery Road. I'm James Nelson. In this episode, we're in for a doggone rough ride on some roads from yesterday. It's a stagecoach journey and a front row seat with some of the best drivers ever. Plus, how one family parlayed their stagecoach stop into their favorite gathering place. And of course, we'll find out just what people carried with them on that bumpy ride into an unsettled tomorrow. There had never been anything like it before. A stagecoach rattling over ungracious roads, past sagebrush, over prairies, by rivers and over mountain passes. Carrying the freight, the gold and the passengers, Imagine the scene and the thundering sound of horses pulling jangling wagon gear and slapping leather reins, creating a chaotic jumbled chorus of barking words and husky horse huffing and puffing. And the arrival scene must have awakened people like an alarm clock, their necks stretching, eyes popping, ears up and on duty, like a black-tailed jackrabbit. The arrival of the stagecoach in these western rural isolated towns was a big event. Probably came in about once a week, so uh, it wasn't a rarity or an odd thing. The stagecoach came in with noise and dust and fanfare. There would have been horses whinnying, uh, chains rattling on the harness, dogs barking, kids running along behind the stagecoach. The loafers that hung around the station would be there to make sure everything went off correctly, and uh, they were excited. It's a quiet place now, but you can bet about 150 years ago it was a big transportation center. A stout, built-to-last rock structure an important stagecoach stop. It remains a standing monument to an inspiring family story. Dave Terry, um, fifth generation from uh, Thomas Earl Terry Sr. that settled up here at the ranch. We're at the Terry Ranch. Uh, we're about 12 miles west of Enterprise, uh, Utah, down the southwest corner of, of Utah. Thomas Searles Terry has a fascinating history. He dug the first well in the Salt Lake Valley, served as a bodyguard to Apostle Parley P. Pratt, and later was sent to oversee the Southern Utah Cotton Mission. He had four wives and 30 children and relied on this place, just beyond the reach of prosecution, for practicing plural marriage. Generations later, it's known as the Terry Ranch, a big gathering spot for friends and family. If times got bad, this would be a place that they could come for refuge and just be protected uh, up here. Um, like I say, in the summer times, the, the big reunions on the 24th of July, we've, we've had as many as 320 people up here for that. Most time we feed oh, between 180 and 240 people, and that's all descendants of, uh, of Mary and Lyman Terry, which is my grandfather, which is the grandson of Thomas Searle Terry Sr. Elva, Terry, Singleton, and we are at Terry Ranch, the home of which Granddad established and built. As the youngest of 11 children, Elva learned the early stories about harsh winters, herds of cattle lost to storms, and devastating floods that pushed the family to the brink. And generations later, she watched her own father plant crops and do all the chores, wrestle with the elements, and somehow make a go of it out here on the ranch. And I'm always reminded uh, all these years, we know how hard the pioneer tricks was coming into Utah, what they suffered, and the lives that were lost. But I saw that here at Terry's Ranch. So, excuse me for being emotional, but for me, that was so much history, knowing uh, how important this place was. Okay, now it'll clean out. 
This right here is the family spring. Um, up here is where they got water for all the uh, their household needs. And actually back then, they had uh, taken it to the stock out in the crails. They use it for bathing, washing, feeding, whatever. High above the beautiful Terry Ranch resting peacefully is where the other side of life in the Old West is carved in stark letters on a small tombstone. Grandfather's sisters, uh, when she's about two years old, uh, made it out of the house and got down here and she drowned in the, and down in this well down here. Um, so that's you know, you know, the necessity for water, but it could also be a tragedy there. And it's just, you know, it's just, it's just part of our history. And, and we do our best to keep the, the little kids around. We try to keep it covered all the time and, and keep, the, keep the kids away from it. But it's, it's just a, a neat water source that we have here to maintain and, and, and use. <laughs> Built in 1873, the stone structure stop remains a lasting example of the Stagecoach Chronicle. It was known as Moroni Springs. Stables for horses, lodging space for drivers and passengers. In the rock building, gun portals are still there. Reminders of days when bank robbers were on the prowl for the nearest sack of gold or silver. The whole ranch has been an important piece of history um, that was the connection between Silver Reef and Peoria, Nevada. Um, I mean, the Silver Bullion come through here and on the way to, from Silver Reef to Peoria, and then they would have the, the pay would come through here from Peoria going back to Silver Reef to pay the miners. Back when the stagecoach would uh, come to the ranch, come through the ranch from Silver Reef going to Peoria, Nevada, they'd stopped off there at the ranch. Um, they would, uh, they was able to change horses, get fresh horses to continue on. Um, they had their bathroom breaks, whatever they had. And then uh, great, great grandma, Mary Ann Pulse for Terry, um, she'd prepare the meals for them. As the stagecoach come into Moroni Springs, um, they just knew that they was gonna get a good meal and, and uh, a good place to sleep if they needed that they'd be well taken care of. Um, in today's saying, it'd probably be a five-star rating, a five-star motel, but, but they'd get it at, the, at Moroni Springs and the Terry Ranch. The imposing roadside stone building was an essential stop for the stagecoaches, carrying passengers and precious cargo like gold, silver, and stock certificates in those trunks. For the Terry family, this outpost is still a special stop, a respite, and a very important reminder about the long road traveled and the treasure box left behind. I remember as a little girl, Dad said, this will always, it's your mother's wishes, this will always be a, a gathering place, not only for our family, but for travelers coming through. And many times people stopped and dad would visit with them and, and he'd say, well, Leona, you've got something we can put on the table. These folks are probably hungry. So they fed a lot of strangers and then they waved them goodbye on up the road. At the Frontier Homestead State Park Museum, you get a look at some marvelous stagecoaches donated by this man, Gronway Perry. It happened years ago. You see, he knew moving people was always fundamental. Perry teamed up with others to form the National Park Transportation and Camping Company, providing lodging and transport to what would become Zion National Park. Grunway Perry built this uh, stagecoach. It's modeled after the famous Concord stagecoach built in Connecticut. This coach, um, like I say, is a replica. And uh, we do let people who come to the museum sit inside this one. The other vehicles, because they're originals, we don't allow them to sit in. So, but they can take pictures of themselves standing in front of them. This is what it would have been like traveling for 16 days, 24 hours a day. Oh boy. Only stopping when you, the horses were changed about every 10 to 12 miles. Okay, happy trails. You bet. <laughs> All right. This old timer and overland coach, also known as the mud wagon, has some pretty significant miles on it. A drop down leather covering, 
a scuffed greenish coloring to the wood, and a souvenir bullet dug out and saved for the story. So we know for a fact there's a bullet hole in it, so we kind of look at the evidence. Well, obviously there were people traveling with all of their goods. You pack everything that you can to the weight allotment into this wagon to take you across the West. So very likely this was not Native Americans, but more like bandits because they had access to rifles. So what actually happened during that altercation, we may never know. The stagecoaches, the majority of the stagecoaches here in the West were the mud wagon stagecoaches that went across country. The overland stages, the door coaches would be in the bigger cities and, and go in the more populated areas. But when they would get out into the areas that weren't well populated, it was usually a mud wagon stagecoach that they were traveling in. The old coaches, retired now from the rough road of the West, sit quietly in this museum. But just imagine the stories they could tell. We'll hold on. Up these stairs in a white gloves only please old back room, the archives reveal an intimate and very real part of the frontier. So this is one of the letters from our collection that actually traveled on the Overland Stagecoach route. In the early days, this route was mostly used to move mail, but this mail was mostly business mail, so it consisted of bills, letters from customers. But as more and more people traveled west, these letters started to evolve, and all of a sudden you started seeing things like love letters, letters back to their family about how much they missed them, letters about how amazing the west was and why they should come and stake their claim. The leftovers from the stagecoach days do tell us what life was like on the road before there was much of a road at all, giving a bumpy, sometimes rough edge to how things looked out on the frontier back then. You know, we got to remember that back in those early stagecoach days, you know, they'd go across rivers and streams and there weren't bridges. And, um, you know, so they had a coach that could go in those kind of areas and, and come out. The road trips were rugged and rough and ugly in a lot of ways, but they carried people and their dreams and hopes to a better place. In the 1800s, Silver Reef was a mining boomtown, and as the name suggests, silver was the big reason. The Bonanza carried a price tag, though. Locals didn't like it. Gambling, horse races, dances, fist fights, gun fights, and saloons filled with whiskey. A rougher side of life was seeping into the neighborhood, but they found a way to get along and do business together. Uh, it didn't fit in comfortably with uh, the other small towns around here, which were small Mormon towns, agricultural, and along came this mining town. But you know, it was a symbiotic relationship. The, the miners needed to eat, and they needed someone to drive their freight wagons or their stagecoaches. Uh, and the small town farmers needed somewhere to sell their peaches and their tomatoes and their grain, and they needed jobs. Today, it's an interesting ghost town. Mine shafts and equipment are still there. A few buildings crumbling with age are on the property. There's even a replica mine for tourists to explore. But it's this beautiful stone building, handcrafted by stonemasons a long time ago, using the blasted and chiseled out rock from the nearby mining operations that remains the lasting star of the place. We had um, LDS stonemasons from St. George and the small towns in the area who had worked on the tabernacle, on the LDS temple, who built many fine buildings in St. George. So the workforce was there. Once inside the museum, stagecoach history is front and center. Starting with this beautiful bronze of a stagecoach and team of horses by renowned Utah artist Jerry Anderson. I like to tell people that actually the building is our most important artifact. And it is the only uh, original standing building left in the old town of Silver Reef. The building had many uses. It was a mercantile store, a bank, and of course, a stagecoach stop. 
and this original vault was used to hold valuable silver ingots before they were loaded onto the stagecoach. The store shelves are now museum displays, showcasing a mining town's dusty story. You can find everyday items like this jar filled with buttons from long ago clothing. Imagine it. Crude irons to make the shirts look spiffy. And colorful dishes and bottles from a distant dinner time hour. And a faded $10 receipt from yesterday. We found the next best thing to a time machine in Declo, Idaho, a replica 1886 Concord stagecoach. Just look at that beauty. And if it looks familiar, you probably saw it rolling down your main street during the summer parades in Utah, Idaho, and throughout the Mountain West where it rolls on into history. We headed to the local saloon and asked the man behind the stagecoach to come on down, take a seat, and tell us his stagecoach story. It took us four or five years. I was still running a ranch at that time, so I was working out a little bit here and there until we finally got it done. I'm so proud of how we got it so close to the original Concord. And it was just, we're just dang proud of it. And that's all there is to it. I store some harness in here and collars. Bagby immersed himself in stagecoach history and filled his ranch with everything he could to build what he loved. He even studied plans from the Smithsonian Institute so he could get it right. Now this gentleman is an old blacksmith. Everything in here is old tools, uh, forge, tongs, sledge block, tire bender, tire bender, lathe. Well, the inside, there was, we done ours with material, some of them were the leather. As that was built this way, you had more hip room. You could run from six to nine people in it. A couple people on top, the luggage on the back, the back boot. The Concorde was wonderful. Any harness repair and upholstery work. And this here is the thorough braces on the stagecoach. This, it doesn't look important, but it's very important. These two horses have been together their whole life. Uh, they come off the same place. The gentleman that bought them is a young horse. Uh, he bought them as a two-year-old and broke them to drive. They've worked together for 12 years. They're older than that. I've had them for four years, but they've pulled together. They know just exactly what each one of them is going to do. Uh, they know when you turn and you tell them to step one way or another, they, they do. They understand their language. They, they're partners, they're, they're, they're buddies. Utah was kind of a center of everything. And they run all the way through Wyoming, Idaho, Arizona, California, some up to Washington through Montana. But it was all centered out of Utah. And it was wonderful. There was a lot of stagecoach drivers that got killed over a little dab of gold, and that's too bad, too. Just too bad. We heard there was one more stagecoach leaving town, so we punched our ticket for a ride at the Marshfield Stage Depot. Well, you guys know how to aim, don't you? And then stepped into the past. You know, we can't go back in time, but we can ride in a replica coach like this one, 1886 Concord. It's not a luxury ride, it is bumpy, and you get bounced around a bit. That was only one of the things passengers had to worry about. Imagine some of those robbers up on the next hill wanting to get a hold of that treasure box inside. Now, that's a rough ride nobody wanted. This, uh Double barrel 12 gauge was carried. John X. Beadler liked the long barrel. They did have coach guns that were shorter, and they had 10 gauge. But this 12 gauge here was a coach gun off an old coach. And this is, it's just one of my pride possessions, absolutely. He's been recognized for his contributions to Western history and spends lots of time working with schools and communities regarding the old stagecoach days. 
and you compress the inside of your wood to bend it. But it's the calendar on the wall in one of Ray Bagby's outbuildings that says it all. He's stuck in the past. I'm in love with stagecoach history, but the Concord coach and stagecoaching through Gilmer and Salisbury and a bunch of others and Wells Fargo and their express company is one of the most important historical things in this whole country, in my opinion. Perhaps the best known stagecoach driver in the Old West was this man, Hank Monk. Described this way in a museum exhibit, hard driving, hard drinking, a battered Stetson, an old corduroy shirt, trousers stained with tobacco juice, he could turn a six-horse team in the middle of the road at a full gallop. Then there was this, one-eyed Charlie Parkhurst. It's an intriguing story. You see, Charlie was a woman. Born as Charlotte Parkhurst, she was abandoned, escaped from an orphanage, and then figured out a way to survive in the Old West. I assume that she had changed her appearance early on, and once she had changed, she stayed there. And so she did a lot of things other the men did. She chewed tobacco and smoked, and she was an excellent driver. She really, really knew her way around a horse. While she was in the, at, over on the coast in Redwood City, she, one day she was shoeing a horse and it kicked her in the face and knocked one of her eyes out. And at that point, it was one-eyed Charlie. And somewhere around here near the swift and cold currents of the Missouri River and the sweeping beauty you find only in the state of Montana, remnants of the compelling story of stagecoach driver Mary Fields. It's remarkable history you just don't hear every day. The West in the 1800s was untamed, unforgiving, and yet a forever invitation to men, women, and families, including Catholic priests and nuns who loaded their wagons with books, Bibles, and faith and settled on places like the beautiful landscape of Montana, building St. Peter's Mission for Native American boys initially. Later, it was used as a girls' school, headed up by Mother Amadeus Dunn. Other sisters and Mary Fields journeyed west to support the mission. Fields played a key role with her hunting and gardening skills, providing essential food for all in the mission. But her independent spirit led to conflict, butting heads and rifles with a co-worker. Eventually, she was dismissed and sent to the nearby town of Cascade. It didn't lead to any shooting. They had only that sort of a brief confrontation, most of it ver verbal, uh, the nudging of rifles together. Um, but that's been blown into the myth of her as a gunslinger and shots being fired and she could uh, uh, outshoot anybody on the streets of Cascade. I mean, just outlandish things. Mary Field's story has always been an interesting piece of Montana history. There are plenty of books out there featuring her frontier story. For historian Ken Robison, the challenge has been separating myth from legend while bringing important heritage about her forward. He says while the church hierarchy had her removed from the mission, Mother Amadeus assisted in getting her a job as a driver. She spent eight years under contract to the U.S. Postal Service, the first black woman to ever be that, under that uh, star, they called it the star, star contract. And it, they were four-year contracts that uh, the Postal Service would hire employees outside the Postal Service to deliver mail. And of course, her route was between Cascade and the mission. Life out west was rough and driving wagons wasn't easy, but she delivered no matter the road conditions or weather. And she was undaunted by her unique situation. She became part of the community, serving as the baseball team's mascot and providing flowers from her own garden to anyone hitting a home run. Period newspaper articles report she could handle horses, guns, 
and a whip with dexterity, and enjoyed tobacco and a drink with the men. Indeed, she found a way to construct a life out west. I have a feeling that she would have been bored to death with women's meetings or women's social activities. She was, you know, she was every bit of an equal in strength and in size and in interest. Certainly few, if any, came close to her relationship with the men of a small town, including mayors and, you know, these weren't just uh, cowboys in off of the ranches. These were the businessmen in, the, in, in this small town. Over the years, everybody came to know Mary Fields. She was a pioneer, and when she died, a large number of friends and acquaintances paid their last tributes of respect with flowers, songs. Her funeral was one of the largest ever held in Cascade. Mary Fields should be remembered in schools, in books, in newspapers, as a real human being who had to struggle and strategize with racism in Montana at the turn of the century. She did this in innovative ways, and she should be respected for doing so but we must not mythologize her. If you visit Cascade, Montana today, there's nothing notable about Mary Field's life there, but locals are pushing to have their post office named in her honor. The end of the line for stagecoaches and their courageous drivers started with the faint sound of the train whistle, and before long, the oncoming railroad was just too much. Trains were bigger and faster, and when the rails were joined at Promontory, Utah, the celebration meant the stagecoach glory days were over. No one today really knows how Mary Fields, who drove coaches and wagons around these parts more than a century ago, was treated day in and day out. What we do know is indeed she was here and left a unique signature in the American West for all of us to ponder. I'm James Nelson. We'll see you next time out here on Discovery Road. This wagon was used in the movie Proud Rebel, and John Carradine, uh, the senior, sat up on this coach. When it was filmed, it was painted a different color, a green. Mm -hmm.